This is also very relevant because if you are lighter skin, you do not need as much sun exposure or as much vitamin D supplementation in order to get adequate amounts of vitamin D. Whereas if you are darker skin, then you are going to require Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Flu season is here and to help you guys out, I'm going to be breaking down several scientific studies on the efficacy of vitamin D with regard to influenza. But before I start, you guys know the drill. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, ding, ding, ding. And if you don't want to watch the entire video, I will be including timestamps in the description so you can skip ahead to the section that you want. Now onto the topic at hand. Between the months of October to March, flu season is at its peak. And one of the reasons why rates of influenza are at its peak during those months is because during those months, it's a lot colder outside. And because it's colder outside, people tend to stay indoors a lot more. And when they do go outside, they are covered from head to toe. And one of the things that we know is that we get vitamin D from the sun. So if you are indoors and you're covered from head to toe when you do go out, your vitamin D concentrations are going to be a lot lower if you do not supplement because you are not going to be getting as much sun exposure. And another thing with regard to vitamin D is we know that if you have a sufficient amount of vitamin D, this is going to decrease the chance of you getting adverse symptoms when you get influenza. You can still develop symptoms. It doesn't mean you're going to be free and out of the clear, but there is a strong correlation with high levels of vitamin D and lower rates of influenza. Now, the studies that I'm going to be breaking down for you today, I have over two dozen different studies, but I'm going to be spacing them out over the next several months. One of the reasons is because if I were to do them all in one video, then this would turn out to be a two to three hour video. And I know you guys probably don't want to sit through two to three hours of listening to me talk about vitamin D. So Rather than doing one long video, I decided to pick two studies every single week and every single week I'm going to break those studies down and it's going to be a lot easier for you guys to digest. Instead of two to three hours, it's only going to be 10 to 15 minutes. So let's get on with the first study. This first study comes from PLOS One and PLOS One is the Public Library of Online Science and this study is called Serum 25 Hydroxy Vitamin D and the Incidence of Acute Viral Respiratory Tract Infections in Healthy Adults. And this study was published on June 14th of 2010. Now, with regard to this study, the purpose was to determine if there is any correlation between the incidence of acute viral respiratory tract infections and serum vitamin D concentrations. And one of the things with regard to the study is the authors did note that there is a noticeable seasonal variation with regard to influenza and also people living in the same latitude. With regard to those, with regard to the seasonal variations, the authors noted that there are seasonal variations in the incidences of viral respiratory tract infections, such as those caused by influenza. Indoor crowding is commonly thought to contribute to the influenza epidemic seen each winter in temperate zones. However, influenza epidemics do not occur in the summer in crowded workplaces or other gatherings, despite the presence of the virus and a multitude of non-immune persons. And with regard to the different latitudes, the authors noted that influenza epidemics occur simultaneously at the same latitudes across the globe. This was the case even in times when transportation methods did not allow contact between persons over many degrees of longitude over a period of a few weeks. Now, one of the reasons why this may be relevant is because with regard to the sun's rays, the sun's rays are going to be strongest closer to the equator and they are going to be weakest closer to the poles. One of the reasons is because at the equator, the sun is going to be closer to the earth. So the sun's rays do not need to travel as far, whereas closer to the poles, the rays have to travel a lot farther, which is going to make them a lot weaker. Weaker. And because they are weaker, that means it is going to be a lot more difficult to get adequate amounts of vitamin D from sun exposure if you are closer to the poles relative to the equator. So this explains why there is a seasonal variation with regard to influenza. And the authors also noted that there are well-documented seasonal variations in 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations and documented correlations between those concentrations and latitudes of residence. Vitamin D has known effects on the immune system. Vitamin D may modulate the production of cytokines, suppressing inflammation, and thereby reducing the severity of viral pneumonia. And with regard to the study participants in this trial, this comes from table one of the study. It is serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations over the course of study by gender and skin pigmentation. So you can see that there were four separate bloods drawn throughout the course of this study. And in total, there were 198 participants. The first blood drawn was on September 20th, 
2009 to September 28th, 2009, there were 198 participants in that study. And the average vitamin D levels was 28.4 milligrams per deciliter. The second time the blood was drawn was a month later. That would have been October 27th, 2009 to November 4th, 2009. One of the participants had dropped out because there were only 197 participants in that area. And the average vitamin D levels were 27.0. So it did drop a little bit on the second visit. The third blood was done on November 30th to December 6th of 2009. One or a couple more participants ended up dropping out because there were only 195 participants on the third blood drawn. And the average vitamin D levels were 24.6 milligrams per deciliter. And then the last time that they drew the blood, this was the fourth one. It was December 30th, 2009 to January 10th, 2010. The amount of participants stayed exactly the same, 195, and the average vitamin D levels rose to 25.6. Now, with regard to this particular study, they broke it down by gender and also by skin tone. So you can see that with regard to female versus males, the females across the board have higher concentrations of vitamin D relative to males. And also with regard to skin color, the darker your complexion, the lower your vitamin D levels are going to be. You can see that light pigmentation, the average vitamin D concentration was 30.7 milligrams per deciliter with intermediate skin pigmentation. The average vitamin D levels were 22.0 milligrams per deciliter. And then with regard to dark pigmentation, the vitamin D levels dropped all the way to 15.8 milligrams per deciliter. So almost half as what the light skin people had with regard to vitamin D concentrations. So this is also very relevant because if you are lighter skin, you do not need as much sun exposure or as much vitamin D supplementation in order to get adequate amounts of vitamin D. Whereas if you are darker skin, then you are going to require more sun exposure. And if you are going to supplement with vitamin D, it would be more beneficial to consume a higher dosage. And with regard to vitamin D concentrations and also rates of infections, what exactly did the study show for that? Well, with regard to acute infections evaluated, the authors noted that of the 103 clinical acute respiratory tract infections, 89 of them or 86.4% involved physician visits and 14 or 13.6% were documented documented by illness diary only. There were 103 acute viral infections diagnosed clinically in 84 patients during the study. Now, with regard to these different infections, we know that having low levels of vitamin D is going to be a hindrance and it's going to lead to adverse effects with regard to influenza. But what exactly is an adequate amount of vitamin D with regard to helping you to protect against influenza? Well, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations and viral respiratory tract infections showed that vitamin D concentrations of 38 nanograms per milliliter best discriminated between groups that did or did not develop viral infections of the respiratory tract. A vitamin D concentration of greater than 38 nanograms per milliliter approximately halved the risk of development of an acute viral respiratory tract infection. And 83.3% of the 18 people who maintain vitamin D concentrations of greater than 38 nanograms per milliliter for the entire study survived uninfected, whereas only 55% or 99 out of the 180 of the other participants survived without infection. So you can see that the rate of survival without infection was much higher in the group that had greater than 38 nanograms per milliliter versus the group that had below 38 nanograms per milliliter. And aside from adequate amount of vitamin D concentrations being correlated to lower rates of infection, it also correlates to lower amount of time missed from work due to illness. The author noted that for each observation period and for the entire study, the incidence of viral respiratory infections and the percentage of days ill were significantly lower for the group with concentrations of 25 hydroxy vitamin D greater than 38 nanograms per milliliter. In fact, the incidence of infection was 2.7 times lower and the percentage of days ill in the greater than 38 nanograms per milliliter group was 4.9 times lower. So if you have adequate amounts of vitamin D, it is greatly going to reduce your chance of developing some type of infection. And it is also going to greatly reduce the amount of time that you missed to work from work due to being ill. And then the authors concluded that supplementing with vitamin D to raise the concentrations in the general population to above 38 nanograms per milliliter could result in a significant health benefit by reducing the burden of illness from viral infections at a minimum from viral infections of the respiratory tract in healthy adults living in temperate climates. And that's pretty much it for the first study. The next study that I would like to bring up, this one also comes from Plavis One, again, the Public Library of Online Science, and it is called Vitamin D and Respiratory Tract Infection. 
infections, a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. And this one, it's a little bit more recent. It was published in June, June 19th, 2013. Now, with regard to this study right over here, it is a meta-analysis and they did do a systematic review of different studies. So how exactly did they get to those studies? Well, the included studies, there was a total of 1137 studies that they searched for. And of those, 16 of them were retrieved in full text. 11 were included in the final analysis. Now, 11 of the 16 were included, so why were the other five not included? Well, three studies reported infections in general without specifying RTIs, that is the respiratory tract infections, separately. One of these studies compared two different doses of vitamin D and lacked a placebo group. And then a fourth trial did not study the preventative effect of vitamin D. And a fifth trial outcome was presented as a hazard ratio incompatible with the outcome measures and the remaining 11 studies. So that's why those five studies were omitted. And that is why the 11 studies that were selected were chosen in this particular study. Now, one of the things with regard to these 11 studies, it wasn't just a small study with a few people that they had to sample from. Rather, it was quite a large study and a large number of people. In fact, a total of 5,660 patients were included in the 11 studies and they were had an average age of 16 years of age. And the average vitamin D dose was 1600 IU per day. And the dose interval varied between 24 hours and three months. One of the trials used a single dose of 100,000 IU, and all studies were placebo controlled and used orally administered colocalciferol or vitamin D3. Another thing is that these studies had a high methodological quality, and only two trials were judged to be at high risk of bias. The other nine studies, no risk of bias whatsoever. And the calculated number of participants required to provide firm evidence of clinically relevant treatment effect ranged from less than 200 to 5,496 patients. So since the actual number of patients in the meta-analysis exceeded these numbers, it was concluded that an unadjusted significance threshold of 0.05 was justifiable. Now, with regard to this particular study, the average age was around 16 years, but there was quite a vast discrepancy with the youngest to the oldest. In fact, the age ranged from six months all the way to 75 years, but the way that they broke these studies down, they found that although participants re represented a large age span ranging from six months to 75 years, our data do not support any impact of age on the outcome measure. And now the next thing that I would like to discuss is the dosing with regard to vitamin D, because they also looked at different dosing requirements. They looked at taking low daily doses and also very large bolus doses over the course of a month or every two or three months. And what they found was the meta-analysis indicates a protective effect of vitamin D supplementation against respiratory tract infections, although the overall results were in favor of a vitamin D effect. The dosing interval appeared to be a key factor and studies using daily doses of vitamin D showed significantly better therapeutic effect than studies where participants were given a large bolus doses of vitamin D at long intervals, one to three months. Now, one of the reasons why this is very important is because if you do plan on taking vitamin D, this shows that it is going to be much better to take smaller doses on a daily basis rather than taking large doses that are spread out much farther apart. So let's give an example. If you are taking 5,000 IU of vitamin D every Every single day over the course of a month that is going to equate to 150,000 IU of vitamin D. So if you were to take 5 I 5,000 IU of vitamin D every single day, that would be much more beneficial than taking 150,000 IU on the first of the month and doing that every single month. Even though you are getting the same amount of vitamin D, 150,000 over the course of a month, what the study showed was that the daily doses were better than the large doses spread out over a longer period of time. But just because the large bolus dose was not as effective as the daily dose, this doesn't mean that there is never a scenario in which case a bolus dose which would be, would be much more beneficial. One of the situations or one of the instances in which case a bolus dose would be more beneficial would be a bolus scheme could be preferred when compliance is expected to be poor. Dosing schemes once a week may be a good compromise to improve effect compared to bolus doses while still facilitating compliance. And this part right over here, it is not related to influenza, but it is related to the efficacy of bolus doses. And it states that large doses of vitamin D between 33,000 to 150,000 IU, ranging from every month to every four months, have been shown to be efficient in clinical studies of fractures and muscle strength. So even though it is going to be much more beneficial to take vitamin D on a daily basis 
and take a steady dose rather than taking a large dose. If you have somebody that is very non-compliant where they forget to take doses, then giving that person a bolus dose would be more effective because if they are gonna constantly miss their dosages, then taking a bolus dose once a week would facilitate compliance a lot better, which means they're actually going to be able to do it. So if you are the type of person where you are very forgetful or you just do not like to take a lot of pills or supplements, then doing a bolus dose once a week might be more beneficial than taking a regular daily dose if it makes you more compliant. And with regard to this study, what the authors concluded was the evidence from 11 randomized control trials indicates that supplementation with vitamin D could be an effective means of preventing respiratory tract infections. However, due to the heterogeneity of included studies and possible bias, results should be interpreted with caution. So basically, both of the studies showed that vitamin D supplementation is going to help to decrease symptomatic response with regard to influenza. However, more studies do need to be performed. And this is why I'm going to be breaking down several more studies over the course of the next few months. But to basically sum up everything that I discussed in today's video, number one is that vitamin D is going to be protective against acute respiratory tract infections. Number two, patients with serum vitamin D levels above 38 nanograms per milliliter are going to be at lower risk from developing complications such as infections than people that have a vitamin D concentration below 38 nanograms per milliliter. The third key takeaway is that daily doses are going to be much more effective than large bolus doses. So you're going to be better off just taking a steady dose every single day as opposed to taking one large dose every single month. And then the fourth and final thing that I would like to note with regard to these studies is that people with darker skin are going to be at higher risk for developing complications with regard to infections from influenza and also special populations. I didn't really bring this up about the studies, but it was brought up in the studies that I reviewed. So if you are somebody who is either a pregnant woman, if you are an elderly person, or if you are extremely obese, those are all going to be people that are going to be at greater risk and therefore should consider supplementing with vitamin D. Personally, I have been supplementing with vitamin D for over a decade now. It is a staple in my supplement protocol. And the main reason that I take it had nothing to do with influenza. One of the reasons why I started taking it was for my ulcerative colitis. And I found that it definitely made a tremendous impact of everything that I've ever done over the course of the last 10 years. I would say that vitamin D supplementation was probably the one biggest thing that made an improvement in my digestive health and also in improving my immune system. So if you are somebody that has a suppressed immune system, vitamin D may be a beneficial supplement for you to take if you do have low vitamin D levels, but go get your blood work checked. And if you are below 38 nanograms per per milliliter, then it would be beneficial to supplement with vitamin D. But that's pretty much it for today's video. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to smash that like button so I know to make more of these types of videos in the future. And if you're either new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell as I will be uploading new videos every single day. That's it for today's video. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you again tomorrow.